back to normal. Ah, thanks. Thanks, Sekamoni Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe the one in the middle there, I don't know what's her name. <laughs> maybe, I say maybe, huh? So don't have to believe it. <laughs> Did you have a good uh, rest? Good uh, meal and good meditation. That was a very good story about what a master should be. You like to hear? Yeah. Suppose you want to be a master, listen carefully. <laughs> Here is the way, the method and the secret. <laughs> now, <laughs> there was a man, so holy, so pure, that even the angels were so rejoice every time they see him. However, despite his uh, great purity and holiness, he has no idea that he is holy and great, and that is the only problem with this guy. So <clears throat> he just went about his business, uh, and uh, try uh, humbly distributing whatever good he has or whatever goodness he possesses, yeah, without even thinking about anything, just like a flower emitting beautiful fragrance without even knowing that uh, she has fragrance, and it's like the sun diffusing all this warmth and beautiful, nourishing sun rays without ever thinking about it. So that was the way the man was. <clears throat> His holiness lay in this, that he forget each person's past and look at them as they were now, and at the present only. And he looked beyond each person's appearance to the very center of their being, where they were innocent and blameless, and even too ignorant to know what they were doing. And he saw nothing extraordinary about his behavior or in uh, the way he looked at people, because it was a result of his way of life, <laughs> perhaps the purity inside or the way he lived his holy life. So one day, the angel came to him and said, We have been sent by God, and uh, God has uh, bestowed upon you favors that whatever you wish will be given to you. So ask now. So the, the holy man was uh, very <laughs> speechless <laughs> and was at a loss of what to wish for. <laughs> Stupid man, huh? If it were you, huh? <laughs> if it were me too, huh? <laughs> what could we all wish, huh? <laughs> like a better meditation hall, perhaps. <laughs> at least, at least, so it doesn't leak <laughs> when it rains. <laughs> and then we don't have to move our holy cushion from one place to another and get scolded and that. <laughs> and then what else could we wish for? My house, yes, the stinking paint <laughs> order would go away immediately so that I don't cry every morning and <laughs> have a hard time to put back my mascara on. <laughs> and I can sleep better at night without headache, etc., etc. And that uh, it doesn't rain so hard 
You know, it rains okay, but just like sprinkle, you know, perfume, you know, <laughs> just to cool the air, for example, but not to flatten our tent like a pancake. <laughs> well, what? Wow, we could wish for a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, 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 on and on and on. So okay, I think I think we shouldn't be so greedy. We stop here. <laughs> Otherwise. Other people, non-practitioners, will think, what? They practice meditation and they always want so much. All right, <laughs> we don't say it. <laughs> so the man was uh, uh, speechless in his uh, very innocent way and didn't know what to wish for. So the angel has to uh, give them, him a kind of idea, you know. And they ask him, would you like the gift of healing? Huh? For example, the man said, No, I would rather God did the healing himself. Yeah, a clever man. <laughs> he didn't want to do nothing. Yes, uh, okay, then, uh, then we change our wish. <laughs> we would say, No, we rather, <laughs> we, we rather we go to heaven and don't have to meditate even. Huh? Or God come and make the meditation hall for us himself. So the angel continued to ask him, Would you want to bring sinners back to the path of righteousness? No. Oh, it's a funny man. No, he said. It is not for me to touch humans' hearts. That is the work of the angels. Pooh. Then what does he do? <laughs> oh, I could say the same thing, and I'm finished. Huh? Ah, so the uh, angels uh, continue patiently with all reverence, ask him, Would you like to be such a model of virtue that people will be drawn to imitate you? Nah! <laughs> was the man astonished reply. What for? <laughs> for that would make me the center of the attention. Wow, it's clever. This is the worst thing that you could have. The center of attention. Eh. I know what it's like. <laughs> how how does uh, this man become so clever? He has not had the attention, and he knows already. <laughs> yes, I should have known this before. Then what do you wish for? The angel asked. I wish for the grace of God. Was his reply. Having the grace of God. I will have all the contentment and all my desires fulfilled. And the angels were thinking that this man, despite his holiness, is so stupid. <laughs> God doesn't grant favor that often. And God doesn't dispatch an angel to anyone that often in order to grant him boons and favors. And this man, how come he is so holy but so stupid? Huh? So they force him. They say, God's will shall be done. Now you must have a wish or one will be forced upon you. <laughs> I thought God is liberal, but he's a dictator. Huh? We always thought that God give us free will huh? and let you do what you want. Is that not true? How come here he's like a dictator? He forces people to want something. That's a problem with him. Yeah. Okay, then uh, the old man was uh, kind of uh, forced into this situation, and he has to obey God's will. So he said, all right, all right. Uh, then I shall ask one wish. Uh, whatever good uh, be done through me, uh, don't let me know it. Wow, that's nice. I remember when I first... Uh, uh, wish for something. My my teacher, the Buddhist teacher, um, she was a nun and a monk and a few more nuns and a few more monks. You know when they, when I wasn't enlightened, huh? Before I became to became uh, uh, acquainted with the Kuan Yin method, huh? Yeah. And I just the first Buddha I took home uh, in Germany. Uh, that was not the first Buddha, but the first Buddha in Germany because they believe that if I take the Buddha alone home and without the presence of a master or teacher, 
none, then that Buddha is up to no good. I mean, this Buddha would be good for nothing. <laughs> so if you want to worship a Buddha, and you have to, you know, ask the monks or nuns to bless for you and bring it to your house and have a ceremony with flower, incense and food, uh, just symbolic. And then you have to bow to the Buddha and then the teacher and then uh, make a wish, something like that. Mm. And then if your wish uh, will be granted, uh, then all the incense will curl, you know, like a sparrow and never drop on the floor. You know, normally when the incense burn, it drop like cigarette ash, you know. But uh, when, if your wish is sincere and is accepted, then there's all the incense, you know, will curl like a spiral. We burn a lot of incense, not only one, and that's the problem. I don't know why Buddha has to test people, sincerity, to this extent. So many incense, and each of them have to curl like this. Oh, God, I was thinking, I don't think I can make it. <laughs> Look at all the incense. And I always saw the incense ash, you know, drop immediately after it burns. So anyhow, I just do it as I told. And then I wish that, uh, okay, uh, I don't mind. Uh, people told me that human life is very suffering a lot and uh, that we should make a lot of merit in order to get out of human life. But I don't, I don't mind if I stay in human life because it's not so bad for me. And whatever good I have, uh, uh, should be distributed to the people who need it and don't let me even know about it. And that was my wish. And then all the incense curl like this. And I was... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was thinking, my teachers, you know, they bought a special incense for me. That was for sure. <laughs> special one, already curled. <laughs> <laughs> already curl in advance. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're not the spiral incense, huh? the incense stick very straight and they have to curl by themselves with the ash, you know? Yes, that's how the Buddha test, test <laughs> the people's devotion. But I was thinking it's uh, the blessing of my teachers. Yes, they were very holy, these people, the Buddhist nun and monk at that time. The whole family has become nuns and monks and they have I think they have, uh, have uh, helped me a lot in my uh, time in Germany, uh, teach me a lot of things, and I think they are very holy. And due to their blessings, the incense, they are not go straight <laughs> or drop or just curl it. <laughs> I think they have magical power, <laughs> something like that. So they were very happy for me, they think, oh, whatever you wish uh, will come true. Uh, and I don't suppose I suppose not to tell them what I wish inside. You know, I just do it alone. Hmm? So today I tell you, hmm, just to let me know that I'm very good. <laughs> uh, okay, anyhow, you don't have to believe it. <clears throat> after, but after I told you, I don't know if I'm good anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you. Just by the way, I read this and it reminded me of my things. At that time, I didn't practice Quanin method yet, huh? You know, huh? I just recite Buddhist sutra, recite the Buddhist uh, uh, great compassion mantra, and recite the Quanin Bodhisattva name and the uh, name of the medical Buddha and whatever. Huh? Every day I'm busy with all these uh, thick books, <laughs> which I didn't understand half of it. <laughs> So it was uh, accepted uh, that the holy man's uh, wish should be granted. And now God has arranged, because he doesn't want, the holy man doesn't want to know whatever good uh, done through him. So God has arranged it that uh, his shadow will be a great blessing for anybody or anything, anywhere that it falls upon. And the man would never know anyhow, because he will look in the front. So uh, wherever the holy man goes, went, huh? this shadow will fall on the ground, and then it fertilizes the land, and it makes the rain fall where it's needed, and make the sun shine where it's not enough sun, and make the people become healed of all disease, and healed of the affliction of their souls, and uh, uh, make the uh, place uh, prosper, uh, mountains um, became green, 
uh, spring and mount, uh, fountains, also uh, uh, spring forth, forth in different places. <clears throat> and uh, many people who has been, uh, uh, how say, weighed down with uh, karma and bad fortunes began to look uh, more alive and more healthy and more hopeful. And that is the benefit of the shadow of this holy man, according to God's arrangement. And all the while, the man never know anything about it, because he always look in the front and do this, his thing, busy with his business, with his, and his eyes always look in the front. He doesn't know what's happening behind him through his shadow. <coughs> This is the true master. Therefore, you never heard of any master who say that he knows anything about what he's doing to you. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Uh, many disciples always praise the real master for helping him, helping her, doing this, doing that, or heal their sickness, or uh, how say change their misfortune and bless their house, or do anything. But the Master never know about it. And don't be surprised. And if the Master say he knows, he's not a Master. <laughs> Maybe some, sometimes the Master knows, you know, through intuition, yeah? And through blessing of God that he knows once in a while. But it's not always uh, conscious to the Master about the good things that he or she does for mankind. Also, um, in the Buddhism, the Buddha say, uh, the one who say he's a Buddha, he is not a Buddha. That doesn't mean that after Buddhahood, you cannot say that you have attained a Buddhahood. You may say so, but that doesn't mean that you are very, very aware about it. You know what I mean? That you do something about it. Because Buddhahood has no definition. Truly, uh, if we say we attain something, <laughs> that is not yet. In the Diamond Sutra, the Buddhas emphasized again, again, and again that there is nothing to attain. And there is no, no Buddhahood to realize. It's not because we couldn't become holy, but everything holy belongs to God, belongs to Buddha nature. And if we have attained our simplicity and purity enough, then that Buddhahood and that God power will reveal itself accordingly, without us having to know about it. How can we use the mind of the human brain to understand the limitless expansive? nature of God, or the Buddha nature. So if we ever professed <laughs> that we know that we are Buddha, we truly know that, <laughs> or that we know we are holy, or we know, or we know God, or thing like that, it's just a way of saying, but it's not truly so. If God can be described and can be known by human brain, then it's not a true God. It's not the true Buddha nature. Buddha nature is within and without us. God is within and without, in heaven and on earth. We are swimming in God, breathing in God, eating in God, have our life in God, have all the essence in God. There's nothing except God around and about us. There's no need to say, I come and touch with God, I look for God. <laughs> he is everywhere. So whenever we feel that we have attained something, huh, stop and remember this story. And if we ever want and, uh, I'll say, to know what is a master like, <laughs> remember this story. A master never knows that he's holy. Doesn't matter what he act or what he like, or sometimes he admit it or whatever, Whatever it is for the sake of sentient beings, or just for the sake of just to, to, to get it over with. <laughs> because they keep asking all the time. 
So then people say, okay, okay, I'm a Buddha, so what? <laughs> what, what next? <laughs> something like that. People sometimes they insist, you know, for you to admit that you are something in order to argue around. Just like uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you come on the bus, you know, sit there, and then somebody will, next to you or opposite you keep looking at you all the time and say, are you American? For example, like that, huh? And then you say, no, I'm not. And she say, but I'm sure you are American. <coughs> and then they say, certainly not, ma'am. And then she keep continue looking at you and say, but you look like. <laughs> yeah, and then just admit it, won't you? You can just tell me you're American, it's free here. So finally, you're fed up, you say, okay, I'm American. <laughs> and then she keep looking at you again and said, well, at the second thought, you don't look like American. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, when I first came out into the world and have contact with human's brain, I was on and on about the blessing of Buddha's power and the Quanic method and all that, yeah, according to their request. And then they keep insisting to me that you, I have to tell them that I'm a Buddha. I said, well, it's, it's, there's no need to say that. And I don't even know if I'm a Buddha. But they say, you are the Buddha. You must tell us. You know, like the Sikamuni say, I'm the Buddha, you know. <laughs> the one and only thing like that. You should say the same. And they keep insisting and pressing me on. After a while, I say, okay, I'm a Buddha now. <laughs> and then they say, but when I remember Buddha Sutra, Diamond Sutra, they say, when the one who knows he's a Buddha, he's not a Buddha. <laughs> no, 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 you tell me. <laughs> oh, we cannot win, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so just know yourself, huh? Oh, don't know yourself. Whatever you're comfortable with, is okay. <laughs> we cannot argue back and forth with all these human people, human, because their brain <laughs> are made this way. <laughs> Just to make trouble where trouble is not. Just to ask question where question is not necessary. <laughs> and to give answer when answer is not seeked. Thing like that. Always the same. So, what we do is just to continue with our, our daily business, huh? and then uh, do the best of our ability uh, according to our knowledge, according to our conscience about what a good human being should be and what we should do in this life, our duty, our daily work, huh? just to, to do the things that we feel good with, that we think that we should do. And that is, that's it. And if God is pleased, with our behavior and purity, then God will grant us whatever we need or whatever is beneficial to mankind through us. So there's no need to worry about your level or whether you have attained Buddhahood or you have uh, gone to the ninth level or not yet. Hmm? I'm still on the fifth, but you've gone to the ninth already. <laughs> the master supposed to to be at the fifth level, but some people <laughs> think they're on the ninth. <laughs> Congratulations. <clears throat> it's a little bit too far for us, but <laughs> it's okay if he likes to go there. Mm. And according to this story, huh, the saints don't know much about the good things that is attached to him and his shadow, because also, the people was very centered on the shadow that they even forgot about the man. Mm. And so, uh, his wish that uh, whatever good has been done to him uh, should not be revealed to him has come true. God has granted him this wish. And this is exactly what the Master is, according to my humble knowledge and opinion and experience. So if you want to ask me what the Master is like, he's like this man, nothing more. Whatever good's done. Okay, okay, come on. I need it. <laughs> I need your <laughs> encouragement so I, so I can go on and think that I'm good. 
and holy. <clears throat> wow, isn't that beautiful, our surrounding now? I just come look and wow, you're praising, I have a time to look. Isn't that beautiful? Huh? Yes. Ah, okay. If you ever want to know what the Master is like, huh? or thank the Master for anything, it's not necessary, really, because it's God power who is doing all this. So the Master is always free, naturally. It's like one of us, <laughs> never have the burden to carry the holiness <laughs> on his shoulders all the time, or having to take care of this holiness, of this Buddhahood, so that it doesn't slip away, or that he doesn't fall out, fall down on another level, or thing like that. Once you attain Buddhahood, once God is pleased with you, He does not withdraw the uh, the favor. So He will continue to have this all His life without even know about it. What for should we know? If we do good to mankind, what for should we know about it? It's mankind who are benefited. So that's the main pro- the main the main uh, important thing, huh? Because we want to benefit people. So if they get the benefit, <laughs> doesn't matter where from or how it's done. Many of the not many master on earth, but some of the master that I met, the true master, they are like that. Very very humble and, and very ordinary. They they don't really know their supremacy inside. They don't know their holiness. Maybe they love people, they bless people according to their wish, but they don't feel themselves <laughs> is the blesser. Do you understand that or not? Yes. Maybe they act like a master because people expect it, just like the lady keep asking, you American, are you? <laughs> and finally you say, so, yes. <laughs> just, <laughs> okay, okay, why not? Keep uh, refusing all the time, make so much trouble. So you, the master is like that. Just act accordingly so that everyone is pleased and happy and just to make things simple. Hmm? Otherwise, the master never think, never feel that he or she is a master. That's why I don't have problem integrating with you. But you have problem integrating with me because you always carry a master in your head. And I don't carry any disciple at all <laughs> in my mind. I look at you as one of a person. That's why I don't like it when you're too over humble and you overacting as you love me so much, respect me too much, whatever. I, I don't feel natural. Uh, recently, I know a person and I say, oh, you can be my friend, no problem. And for me, no problem, but for him, it's a problem. <laughs> because he always thinks I'm a master. <laughs> I say, I never think of you as a disciple. So something like that, you know? So it has never any ob- obstacle or obstructions or frontier in the beginning. But you always have problem being my friends. And that's why I don't have friends. Because you put me too high. <laughs> and you put me separately. And that is why we have problem communicating with each other. And that's why you always misunderstood what I tell you often. And that's why you don't do the thing I requested, because you think whatever do for me must be very special, extra special, whatever it is, and then it turns out terrible. Because you do it with the ego, with the way you think, not the way it should be done. That's why everything done for me is a mess, always, never <laughs> the way I want it, simple and logical and common sense. They have to make so big deal about everything and that I end up suffer. <laughs> For example, the house, you know, it's just temporary house. Okay, just put the wood together, yeah, that I have a space and I put my things protected from the rain, that's it. Yeah? Because it's uh, quickly done and it might not live again later, so why have to pay for work and paint and all that? Make me suffer every day. Just because you think it should be done that way. I didn't request, I just request my thing put in there for me, that's all. I know that the, the, the place is temporary, I don't have it painted color or paper wall, or nothing, this is not necessary. All the paint when it's new, you know, is poison. 
and I have to suffer like this for at least a week or eight, ten days because of your good intention that, that often paved the road to hell. Mm. This is very impossible. That's why to be a master is such a difficult job huh? and such a suffering position because people heap upon you their own opinions about what a master should be, what a master should have, what a master should like, what a master should leave. That's therefore the master it become like a prisoner in your heart. And when it's so many hearts put together, the master is finished. The worst criminal have only one solitary cell. Is that a solitary cell? <laughs> but a master have thousands, hundred thousand, millions of solitary cells to live in. Do you understand? Because our mind is very narrow and limited. The love in our heart is a human made. So the master have to stay there, you know, and do work the way we think. Otherwise, we give the master hell. Like uh, you don't expect the master to do this, you don't expect the master to wear that, you don't expect the master to speak like this, and da 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 da, da. and you give this uh, rejecting uh, and uh, refusing atmosphere to the master every time in your heart. And that's how you make a master a prisoner in your frame, in your narrow walls of your mind. And that's how the master have to suffer. It's like a bird, you put it in a cage. Doesn't matter if it's an iron cage or a golden cage, it's still a cage. And so the master cannot be free. Because of the master's love for mankind, he or she will not be free until everyone is free. Well, it's no problem. Just so to let you know what it is like. Uh, because you always ask me, what is it like to be a master? And what would the master feel like? Or how is it? What made of? <laughs> what is a master made of? The master is made of simplicity, just like every of us. Just because we complicate our life, that's, therefore we cannot be one with the, uh, the universe, and God cannot uh, contact us. Huh? We build walls of uh, <coughs> preacher, prejudice, or prejudice, I never get this. Prejudice, yes. We build walls of prejudice, of uh, religious expectation, of a social behavior pattern, anything, anything, to separate ourselves from the natural way of life. And that's why we could not become a master. Originally, everyone could. So as long as we still occupy ourselves with such thing as, uh, <laughs> you know, what other people think, <laughs> or what a master should be like, we can never be one. Just drop every ideas. Yeah, be as a child, and then you will know what it's like. But it's better still that you don't know people and you don't go out teaching, you don't lecture and all that, <laughs> because <laughs> then you're finished. <laughs> people will <laughs> surround you with all kind of trouble, all kind of walls and frames. That is very difficult to move in your life. You still can try. But it's difficult and a lot of suffering, mentally, uh, inside, huh? not the outside. Outside you don't see much. <laughs> if some people cut your arms or bruise your legs, people see it and sympathy with you, but if it's bruised inside, very difficult. No one knows. <sighs> okay, a any, any special question you think of today? Hmm? Everyone's happy? <coughs> oh, good. Me too. <laughs> uh, you want to hear a story of a uh, Buddha? Previous, previously.
Now there's a golden monkey. <laughs> Once upon a time, huh? when the Buddha was still in the transmigration cycle of 84, 84 thousands, he was a golden monkey in the Himalayas. He was very big, huge, a giant monkey and the king of his troop. The troop of this uh, monkey uh, village uh, how say, com- com- comprised of 8,000 strong monkeys. Not monk, huh? Monkeys. <clears throat> they live in the forest by the side of the Ganges River. The water there gushed forth every day, pure and clear from the rocks. And uh, nearby there was a very beautiful, shady, great tree. In summertime, this tree bore enormous golden fruit. (laughs) Even fruit must be golden. (laughs) For the previous incarnation of the Buddha, God planted a golden tree there. See what that? If the Buddha lived somewhere else, that tree would be (laughs) silver-like, or maybe just ordinary tree. But because the the (laughs) reincarnated future Buddha was born as the golden monkey there, saw the tree there bear golden fruit as well. See that? So hurry up, be a Buddha, and eat the golden fruit. (laughs) And then your meditation hall will become golden as well. Don't blame me for the rain yesterday huh? and the flood here. Huh? It's your karma. Hmm? Uh, if you meditate better, probably you have a better roof and not leaking. <laughs> Maybe your, ma- your practice is leaking somewhere. <laughs> so this is a reminder of uh, we should conceal our practice and fix it where it leaks, okay? As soon as uh, the fruit was ripe, the monkeys ate them all up as fast as they could, because the monkey king, uh, who was extremely wise, had told them a warning that they should never allow a single fruit to fall in the water, because when the fruit uh, falls in the water, the currents will carry them downstream. And then if any human beings happen to see the fruit so delicious and golden like this, they would come up here and try to get the fruit. And if they come here, the monkeys will be in danger as well. It's how wise, huh? Wise monkey. Now the one branch of this tree was hanging low over the river. And uh, there was one only one single ripe fruit which was hidden behind a net of a bird or something. And because they overlooked this fruit, the monkeys, this fruit ripe and on time, in time fell into the river and carried away downstream by the rapid current. Rapid current. It, it drifted further and further downstream until at last it reached the city of Benares. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. From all the city in the India and from all the country in the world, <laughs> the Buddha has to be born again and again in Benares and in India. Huh? Not fair. Don't you think so? So one morning, Brahmadatta, the same king again. It's funny. <laughs> the king of Benares. Uh, he was bathing uh, in the river. And then t- uh, when he finished the bath, uh, one of the fishermen nearby pulled the net, a fishing net up. And uh, in the net was the shining golden fruit. And the king was struck. 
No, the the fisherman was struck with the with amazement as a delicious and beautiful fruit that they have never seen before. So they uh, uh, ran to the king and show it to him. The king uh, looked at it curiously, and because he has never seen such a fruit before, so he asked them, "What kind of glorious fruits fruit is this?" And the fisherman, who only knew how to catch fish, <laughs> don't know anything better. They say, "We do not know, sir." So the king called the forest forest uh, keepers and asked him. So the forest keeper replied that it is a mango. <laughs> How disappointing! <laughs> I was thinking something more beautiful and valuable, but mango. Okay, perhaps at that time mango was not so in abundance, huh? And not many people know what it's like. Actually, mango is delicious, no? Do you have mango here in your kitchen? Yeah. They buy for you? Okay, good. And when, when, when I was a child, huh, mango was one of my favorite because perhaps I was a monkey before. <laughs> well, I still have some hair. Don't you see? <laughs> that was a leftover from the previous <laughs> reincarnation, I guess. <laughs> Because we have a lot of mangoes now, huh? We plant it even in the United States or even some of places in European, so we took it for granted. Otherwise, if we happen to live in a very old time, like Shikamoni Buddha time before, huh? And then all the fruits were not so readily available because the farming techniques and uh, all this uh, mm, uh, cleverness to alter the the, the, I say the water and all the uh, fertilizer has not been available to mankind. So if uh, whatever we have fruit, uh, whatever fruit we have is not always uh, good huh? and not so all kind of fruit like today we see in the market. Mm. Uh, uh, thus, uh, this mango fruit has not been known to the king. And it's golden, huh? It's really golden. <laughs> it looks like gold, huh? Uh, the mango color, and it tastes delicious. Oh, I have not had my lunch yet, and I feel water coming. <laughs> mm. um, not even breakfast. Yeah, have you had yours? How many meals you eat a day? Twice only. Is that enough for you? Okay, me too. I feel it's too much already. I'm feeling heavier and heavier now, because <laughs> I'm not used to eating two solid meals a day. I normally eat one and another, very light or not at all. And now I'm eating twice a day, you know. Wow! It happened that some good cook is available. Oh, I'm feeling heavier, you know. <laughs> and every time I walk on the stage, I have to <laughs> be careful <laughs> not to uh, not to damage the good work of the carpenters. <laughs> so uh, the uh, king asked the forest foresters, uh, "Where does it where does it grow this mango?" Uh, the forester replied, "Say, uh, Your Majesty, uh, this fruit doesn't grow in our kingdom. This fruit fruit tree doesn't grow in our kingdom." This fruit grows far away in the distant valleys of the Himalaya mountains. So the mango was cut, and the king tasted a slice. Then he gave the rest to his queens and ministers. They all exclaimed in wonder, Truly, this is a fruit with a divine flavor. We have never tasted the like before. Wow! Can you imagine how lucky we are nowadays? We eat three of them every day if we want. Yeah? And at that time, even the king of a nation can have, have only one slice of it and <laughs> never tasted it before. Yes, can you imagine if we have never tasted a mango before? It must be delicious 
to us, huh? I remember it tastes wonderful as I was a child. And I always like a lot, a lot of them. And there are many different kinds of mangoes which taste even differently delicious. Huh? Do you taste all of them? Yeah. Ah, yeah, take your chance. There are a lot here. <laughs> if you go to the Far East, like uh, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, or Cambodia, then uh, avail yourself yeah? and eat all the delicious foods, fruit that don't grow in America. Oh, they have them, but uh, imported, huh? And it's not uh, maturely ripe, and it's uh, chemically treated and all that. It's not the same as if you pluck from the tree and eat it. Mm. Uh, I have a, a place uh, uh, built for me in Thailand, and around the garden there were a lot of mango trees, and they were, were absolutely delicious because you pluck them from the tree when they're just ripe. Not only they're sweet and tasty, they're so fragrant, you cannot believe it. It's like perfume. Yes. <clears throat> and you have to eat it while your stomach is empty, like, you know, when you have nothing else in the morning, you have it for breakfast, then, wow. That's... <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason why the... Uh, uh, the, the Occidental people would like to come to Thailand or uh, uh, Eastern countries so much, huh? because the fruits are different and the vegetables even different while you're eating in that country. When imported or planted in another soil of a different continent, the taste will be different. Just like even ginseng, huh? <laughs> the name is the same, but American ginseng is cheaper <laughs> than Korean ginseng and the effect of both are very, very different. You know, huh? So uh, after they ate the fruit, uh, the delicious golden mango, the king and uh, all the people who tasted it long for more. <laughs> if they long for enlightenment this way, <laughs> would be better. And his, the desire of the king for the fruit grew more intense each day until he can't bear it anymore. He couldn't sleep. <laughs> he couldn't eat any other thing for thinking of the mango. He became love-stricken with the mango flavor. <laughs> now, just like everybody, every lovesick person, he has to go try to, to find a way to find the beloved. So finally he decided to set out to this far distant land of the uh, uh, Himalayas Valley to find the fruit. So they made a raft and uh, the king and his men sailed up the river. Wow, just for one mango tree, for man one mango fruit, they uh, risk counter currents yeah, to go up the stream and climb the Himalaya mountain. And for the enlightenment and liberation, not many people venture to do that. Don't you think it's funny? It's strange? Yeah, yeah, people do that. Sometimes they go in search for gold or mines of uh, precious stones and they risk their life huh? and money and everything in order to find it. But the most precious stone lay in within human's heart, people don't bother to find. That is very strange indeed. Huh? <clears throat> so here, after a long journey of many days and many nights, wow, phew, they reached the mountain valley where the mango tree stood on the river bank. You must understand, this is not easy as these two sentences sentences described is mountains and rivers and Himalaya at that time is a wilderness. You understand? Even in my time it's still a wilderness. Even you go there in summer, uh, in May or June, the snow is still cover all the mountains and the roads were cut through ice cubes <laughs> and uh, snow a uh, hip, you know, that uh, the bus uh, run uh, between the mountains look like an ant crawling between 
two, <laughs> two big rocks, giant uh, rock side, you know, like that. And if you uh, happen to go on foot, oh, it's terribly. You have to go through very uh, small path and dangerous. Yeah? And one, if you slip down once, then you became pulverized <clears throat> because the cliff is very, very deep. And the mountain is very uh, slippery with the glass, glacier, huh? Glacier, yes, yes. And if you're not careful, you slip any time. That's why if anyone survive coming back from such a pilgrimage, a very to such a holy and far away and high mountains, and coming back to the city or to the human inhabitants, then people would bow to them thinking they are very holy, and the gods has protected them so that they can come back uh, safe and in one piece, <laughs> and not become powder, <laughs> not come back in a jar, you know, <laughs> but come back on food. <laughs> so now, so when, uh, they, when they say that after many days and nights of traveling, you know, to uh, the... Himalaya Valley, you must imagine, you must imagine extra uh, hardship and uh, troubles that the king and his ministers have to go through in search for this mango fruit. Uh, There is no uh, road, no paved road there, and even the horses cannot go in many places. So even if the king took the horses with him, he cannot ride the horse will sleep and die. He cannot be used to with this kind of a small path like this and slippery glacier. So it is very difficult places to go, the Himalaya, especially in such a very holy places and remote areas where no human beings set foot or they just set foot in summer um, for pilgrimage and nothing more. Only summer, a few months, two, three months, Huh? And winter, the road is all covered with snow, as high as mountains, nobody can travel. And whoever lives inside, they have to go out for summer, uh, for winter, and come back in summer. Only some of the army's unit will be uh, stationed there uh, with their provisions, yeah, to last whole winter long. That's why many yogis and masters favor Himalayas, if you can take enough provision for yourselves to last the whole year, or at least in winter, you can stay there. You can dig a hole in the snow and keep yourself warm like the Eskimos people. And you can use a deer, deer skin for your clothing, and you can keep a glowing fire all day long. Then it's become warm in your cave. And sometimes some of the masters stay in the cave uh, during the winter, and the snow cover the whole cave outside, so he will never go out. Just like uh, like um, <coughs> Milarupa, he stayed there during winter, and then he would uh, eat whatever available inside the caves. Or you keep a provision, and in the Himalaya you cannot have the provision the way you do in our kitchen. I'm sorry, I don't imagine. All you have is perhaps uh, dry uh, mung beans, yeah, or some kind of beans and rice, and the water you will cook from the snow melted from your, in your pot on the fire, and that's it, huh? And some salt, perhaps. Or some, yeah, because mung beans is very nutritious, and this is a staple food, huh? Stable food of the uh, Indian people, especially for the Himalayan practitioners. So if you go there, don't expect yourself to have tofu and <laughs> Ham, <laughs> three pieces, one person. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's very difficult to drag your own body up to that kind of a remote area where no human beings will disturb you, let alone take a lot of, of, of stuff, you know, because you have to have your clothes, yeah, blanket, and stuff, and uh, some utensil, things like that, a very minimum. When I was uh, in the Himalaya, I have only one. First, I have a lot. <laughs> you know, as every of you, I drag along a big suitcase, you know. 
spoon, fork, chopsticks, <laughs> uh, china ware, <laughs> whatever from the kitchen, and a big sleeping bag and uh, a lot of clothes. <laughs> and as I go higher, the things become less. <laughs> I can't carry. So finally, <coughs> I was at the top of, not yet at the top of the Himalaya, but uh, in the middle way, with one sleeping bag, one uh, staff, oh, is that right? The staff to walk with, with, uh, with I carry the sleeping bag on top, and one pullover, very thin, cashmere, very, 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 very thin, you know, like paper. <laughs> and two pairs of clothes, two pairs of uh, white, just white clothes, the, the way, you know, the, they call it bunjab-like, you know, like a tunic, yeah, long cover your behind, <laughs> your knees, and then the trousers, that's it, two. I wash one and wear one, that's it. Nothing else I can carry. And all the utensils, the, you know, stainless steel cups and <laughs> silver spoon, whatever, uh, just drop on the way. So I, I kept, originally I kept two, and, and one spoon, one fork, but later on it become only one. You know, first one, uh, one like, uh, like, do you have like uh, the cup, steel cup, huh? mm? for drinking water and tea and all that? And another plate like this, huh? a little bit thick, huh? to cook chapatis and have rice and food and vegetable, you know? <laughs> but later on, <laughs> I dropped that cup also, <laughs> and the forks. <clears throat> and then I have to have that dish alone, for tea, for rice, for chapati, for cooking, for water, whatever it is. Because it's become heavier and heavier, you cannot imagine. So I have only one pair of uh, sports shoes, two pair of socks, and two pair of very thin cotton uh, clothes, that's it and two pair of underwear, of course, don't hope. <laughs> Very thin, too. Nothing else I can carry, yeah? Because I, I can't afford uh, people to carry me on, on their back. Also, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't believe going on pilgrimage and other people have to carry you. <laughs> what kind of merit? <laughs> so, <clears throat> I was determined to make the God moved, you know, with my <laughs> uh, piousness. So I walk on foot. But many Indian people, they went on horses, where, as far as the horses can go. Or have people carry on their back or carry with the, uh, how say, what they call it, kind of chair? Sedan chair? No. Sequin? Huh? Sedan chair? Yeah? Four people carry on four sides and you sit in the middle? Yes, yes, yes. So many people, when they see me walking around like that alone, they think I'm very holy. <laughs> yes, my clothes become holy with the time, <laughs> many holes. <laughs> and my shoes have many holes too. So I consider myself as not very, yes, it's some, somewhat very holy. <laughs> and because I walk alone with only one thin pair of clothes you know, on, they think I'm very holy to withstand all this cold because they bundle themselves with blanket on horseback and they have a thick pullover and all that. But I have only a cotton, you know, like pyjama, like, yeah, that's a walking. But it's very decent. I make it like Chinese uh, color here, yeah, very decent and long. So when I walk like this, people think I was a very holy person, but actually it's not. When you walk, you sweat. How can you get cold? <laughs> So I was sweating because the road is very difficult. It's not uh, so, I would say, flat like here, and it's not paved with stone. Huh? You have to climb sometime on the rocks and then avoid pitfall and avoid slippery rocks. And all oh, the road is not uh, made for for high heel, huh? <laughs> and I have to to wear one pair of uh, of uh, sports shoes only. And and even that, you know, the the snow. The cold with water will soak, soak in, soak in your your shoes. And so when I arrive somewhere, my feet are very swollen and and stiff. And if you don't have a fire somewhere to warm yourself, then uh, it stay like that for many days and very hurt. And I also don't have a fire. But when I see some people make fire somewhere, I just sit behind <laughs> and and air my clothes <laughs> like this. <laughs> And it's okay. I still survive, no problem. 
Why I talk so much about that? Okay, okay. Just to let you know, uh, it's truly like that in the Himalaya, huh? It's not just they say, oh, many days, many nights journey, and then they arrive. <laughs> it's not that easy, because uh, during the journey you don't have a tea, tea houses or restaurants or nothing like that. You have to bring everything with you. So you can only bring flour and salt to make chapatis and then eat uh, that with the uh, Ganges water. That would be the best for you. Then you don't have to bring a lot of things. Because uh, if uh, you are such a small person like me, uh, you can't even carry mung beans. It's too heavy. And in the Himalaya, it's very difficult to cook mung beans, you know? The, the, the atmosphere is very thin, somehow. And you cook all day long, it doesn't boil. <laughs> So I resort to eating raw vegetable, whatever I find in the Himalaya while I was there. Sometimes, not all the time. And sometimes yeah, in some other places you will find uh, food style, you know, but very limitless. Like we put probably uh, four pack of cookies, yeah, and one pack of tea, uh, tea, uh, tea powder, and a pack of uh, half a jar of milk powder. And that's it. If they serve about two, three person, their provision finished. That is a supermarket in Himalaya. <laughs> and they probably have uh, one kilogram of flour, you know, <laughs> to make enough chapati for maybe ten person. And you eat two, two, two person, two chapatis each. And that's it. You have to wait until tomorrow until the, somebody else carry the provision come to them, and then they probably cook again for you. So even you have money, you cannot buy the things you want. Huh? If you came late and other people have eaten already from that food shop, then you finished. Because this is a small mountain food shop, you know, they don't have the money to buy a big provision to keep it there for you. And the Indian people, they believe in eating fresh, you know, they go and do, buy vegetable every day. They don't have refrigerator, they don't believe it. <laughs> Probably never heard of it. <laughs> the Himalayan folk, they're very simple. Mm. And if uh, you ask them anything and they shake their head, that means okay, huh? Don't misunderstand, okay? <laughs> when they shake like this, that means yes. <laughs> so I, when I first came, I always had trouble. I said, I just want to chapati. Why you don't give it to me? <laughs> because it, it, it looks like this. <laughs> and I said, I saw you have them. <laughs> it's <a> chapati. Yeah. <laughs> And he just <laughs> like this. <laughs> so I said, okay, I have myself. <laughs> oh, it's very cute. <laughs> oh, and I tell you what, the, the chapatis in Himalaya mountain is the best food in the world. What after you walk 40 kilometers, <laughs> empty stomach. <laughs> Then it's become golden delicious. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to be reincarnated as a golden monkey or something <laughs> to enjoy because it's really, really delicious, and you never have enough of it. And the problem is that they never have enough of it either, so you always feel <laughs> you don't have enough, <laughs> and you have to look forward to the next style or somewhere else in order to have chapatis again. And I tell you true, I never enjoy food so much as when I was in India. Everything tastes so good. Ah, oh, God. Because you always have to walk everywhere <laughs> and spend all this flower energy. And uh, as soon as uh, you can get something, which sometimes could be uh, 30, 40 kilometers away, so you, you treasure and it, everything. And even if you can find it, if somebody else has not been there before you. <laughs> so most people, they have to carry a little bit of thing for themselves, like dry biscuits, yeah? very, very lightweight, or flour, huh? and then they will, and some salt, if they can. If not, they don't carry salt even. Yeah, I carry salt in a very small plastic, uh, plastic bag. Yeah? Everywhere I go, I will fill it again, if it's empty, because I cannot carry a lot. So just uh, my... Um, maybe 10 hours of flour or something like that, you know, quarter of a pound, <laughs> something like that. And that's enough. And then just one bag small like this and a small pack of salt. And then wherever you go, there's always water, you know. If not from the snow, then from the Ganges River and from people, anywhere, river a lot. 
So that's all you have to carry in the Himalaya. So even if he was a king, you know, I think he has to endure a lot of hardship in order to find this golden fruit. I don't know why he doesn't endure enough hardship to go and find the, uh, how say, enlightenment. Huh? That way, then he would have become Buddha <laughs> instead of be re- be there all the time and 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 taking the golden deer or uh, competing with the monkey for the fruit and <laughs> things like that <laughs> below his dignity. <clears throat> so we have enough with Himalaya or not? Anything else? I have forgot. Just by the way, because I know many of you are curious to know what it's like there. Huh? I can't describe it enough in word actually, but they're beautiful. The beautiful mountain, the most beautiful mountain I have ever seen. Because it's like the mountain is like this, huh? One after another, huh? Like this, huh? And then it's all covered with snow, as white as, uh, you know, the cotton. And nobody ever set foot there, not even animals or nothing. So it's just like this, flat, even, and smooth, like a blanket there. And then just sticking out of this white is green ever pine trees straight up into the blue uh, turquoise like sky it's so beautiful sometimes i just stood there <laughs> and watch you know in wonder even if you take pictures even if you videotape it it's never the same and the air you know so pure you could eat it perhaps that's why in the himalaya i was never so hungry and I didn't have to carry a lot of food. And sometimes I go without food. It, it doesn't affect me so much. Some of the uh, Himalaya master or yogis there, they don't eat even. We call them breatharian or Aryan. <laughs> they eat air. <laughs> it's true, it's true. And they have a special technique to take deep breath in certain uh, fashion so they don't have to feel hungry. And many of the yogis there don't even wear clothes because when they stay there long, their clothes, uh, they also become holy, like mine, you know, <laughs> holy clothes. <laughs> and then after too many hold, too holy, then they have to discard it. And then they have to develop a uh, 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 tumor heat. Is it tumor? Huh? I think Tibetan word for No, 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 the uh, um, solar plexus heat, huh? Yeah, you have to invoke the solar <laughs> in your. Uh, abdomen here in order to warm the whole body. And then so most of them uh, look very pink and, you know, very healthy and fat too. Huh? They eat air only. Huh? Very pink and fat. And don't wear any clothes. Just walk around like that. Fancy if I do that, huh? <laughs> and in India, if you walk alone as a woman, people don't have respect for you. I don't know why. So in India, if you're a woman, you have to walk out with your brother, your sister, your daughter, your dog, your cat, whatever, (laughs) but don't be alone. (laughs) I didn't know this. I didn't know this. And I didn't have any companion, so I had to walk everywhere alone. Sometimes I encounter problems, but it's not so much. I deal with it. (laughs) Kung Fu. So, okay, let's go back to um, Yeah, truly, huh? if you have to go alone, be prepared, learn some karate or something. <laughs> I'm not joking, because some, some men in India are very rough, <laughs> especially in mountain. When you walk alone, they don't know what, what you're up to. So one day I was meditating, yeah? And then there was a man come and just uh, touched my, uh, uh, talking to me in India, I don't understand. So I tell him, uh, get out, huh? I meditate. And he still going to touch my cheek like this. So I keep telling them in English, say, no, out. <laughs> he didn't understand, or he tried not to. So I just give him a, you know, <laughs> a blessing <laughs> from one cheek. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
just an ordinary kung fu, you know, flop like this. And then he still was hanging around, so I gave him another. <laughs> or Jesus said, if you, if a man. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, if you slap a man on one cheek and if you give another cheek, you slap it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I practice what I learned. Huh? <laughs> a good disciple of Jesus. <laughs> so after the second uh, Kung Fu slap, he understood and he left. So after that, uh, I have to put on my uh, sannyasin cloth, you know, the seven saffron robe. So to let them understand, uh, <laughs> to stay away from me. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't like practice Kung Fu every day. <laughs> it's tiring. <laughs> Besides, uh, I only eat chapati and mung beans. <laughs> My Kung Fu power is, is, is not very great. <laughs> and if I keep using Kung Fu like this, I don't think I can walk anywhere. <laughs> I'm too tired. <laughs> At that time, I was ordained already in a Tibetan tradition and Hindu tradition as a sannyasin, as a nana. But I didn't want to, to be too obvious, you know, so I just wear the ordinary clothes. But after that incident, I put back the, <laughs> the saffron robe <laughs> just to protect myself. And then something else happened, also the similar. And then people flock around me and ask me to come to their home so that they can feed me and help give me offering and all things like that. Ah, but then, so you don't have this and you have that. <laughs> you never uh, are free in India if you walk alone. So you better don't walk alone, okay? <laughs> I don't know why everywhere I go, people flock around me like that. And this is, that was one man only, huh? But the other people, you know, they come around and ask me to talk to them and uh, thinking I'm a holy person and thing like that. And one of a uh, uh, mother, Indian mother, she lived in Bombay. She was on pilgrimage with her family and sons and daughter, and she wanted to 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 me to marry her son. <laughs> her son was a twenty something, just graduated as a lawyer, and she told me like that. <laughs> I told her I could be his mother. <laughs> it was so cute. Uh, so if you walk alone, you run into all sorts of trouble, you know. Unless you want to marry a lawyer like that, then, <laughs> then you continue. I didn't know all this, you know. I thought, okay, India is a free place. You go anywhere you want. Besides in the West, or even in Vietnam, Cambodia, anywhere you walk alone as a woman, no problem. Huh? I never thought that in India, walking alone as a woman would bring so much problem. Oh, no end. People always come to me and ask this and that and other, either respectfully or this kind of... Uh, <laughs> Kung Fu expectation. <laughs> I think that's it, huh? And mosquitoes. Hmm? In the Himalaya, not, but in some of the places, also holy, like Benares. Wow, mosquito, so big. You would think, you would think airplane is landing on your body. <laughs> yes, they will make your body become <laughs> airport, you know? They keep landing one after another at different hours, <laughs> not on schedule at all. <laughs> so you just have to protect yourself if you go there with a mosquito net <laughs> or repellent, insect repellent, because they really, really uh, think your body is an airport, yes. And the mosquito was so big, you know. Well, I remember in Benares. No, yes. So big, the mosquito. It looked like a mini chicken, you know. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> well, I'm very small, so everything looks big to me. <laughs> and it's not easy to buy insect repellent anywhere you want to go, you know. Especially you just came down from the Himalaya. And if you go to the Himalaya and you come back, you feel weird, you know as if you're walking on a cloud or something. Perhaps the, the air there is different, so thin or pure. When you go back to the plane again, oh, you feel like you're drunk. Yeah, or maybe because they cooked some food for me to eat there that I became drunk for three, four days. 
You never know, they cook all kind of food for you. Vegetable, okay, but uh, maybe from houses or something, plant. They eat it. In India, houses is not a drug. It's vegetable. And uh, mosquito repellent. <laughs> so they probably, uh, sometimes they would uh, gather the dry leaves, yeah, and smoke it up. So if you sit near there for meditation, you're surely in samadhi in no time. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know what it is, you know. I thought it's just uh, some uh, fragrant herbs to repel the mosquitoes, so I s- just sit there, unris- un- unsuspect, <laughs> unsuspected. And then I wonder why my head became like this. <laughs> I walk, you know, like a yo-yo, you know what it is? <laughs> like this. I feel very weird. Mm. Because some of, uh, sometimes you stay in a temple, some a temple near the Himalaya or during the journey. Sometimes you see monks and nuns live there, huh? and they smoke houses too. And you would not understand this, so you did not know. Probably you will be affected by sitting nearby or something like that. Or they would cook it with your tender leaves for you to eat. And they're used to it, so no problem to them. But if you eat after that, you feel, oh, we are the master blessing or something. <laughs> you feel dizzy, yeah? And very uh, light, uh, walking very light on, on the ground, like walking on a crowd, cloud. So uh, there are so many things you should worry about. And there's no toilet there, huh? Ladies and gentlemen. So normally I would wait until dark <laughs> to go out. But then when you hear the, when you hear the roaring of a bear or something, <laughs> then you forget everything else. <laughs> and either you run or you froze. <laughs> because at night there's no electricity there too. And you don't always have batteries enough for your torch. And after you climb for maybe a few hundred uh, kilometers up to the mountain, then the torch have to be gone too, <laughs> because heavy is another burden. Everything must gone. Everything must go. The same with enlightenment. The higher we go, the less we must carry with us. We just have to throw away. Or we stop there. Very, very similar to that situation. <laughs> Nobody tell me, don't bring this don't, this, don't bring that, but I throw away them myself because I can't carry anymore. The higher you go, the heavier things become. Maybe the gravity, huh? Or because your feet has become heavier and swollen uh, with the snow water in your shoes, or because uh, you don't eat enough nutrition, <laughs> or because it's too cold, you spend faster energy than you no- normally would, or because what? Or the hate and the tiredness too. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was fun because at that time I had only uh, God in my mind. I have no fear, no, no thinking, as if my mind has been numb from uh, uh, fear or from anxiety, nothing. But now if you ask me to go back there again, no, no, no. Oh, even you give me a million dollars, I don't go back there again. Oh, now I think about it, so scary. <laughs> I must be blind and deaf in order to go there alone and walk many miles like that, alone in a mountain, in search for masters or God's blessing or what. Every holy place is in India. If I could make it, I go there. And I don't have companions, so I had to go alone. And going alone is a lot of risk, <laughs> but God protected the stupid <laughs> and the blind like me, so nothing happened. <laughs> and I still came back to see you. <laughs> Thanks, God. <clears throat> so if you complain about the ten here, huh? at least you have a tent. Huh? I didn't have then. Even if I have, I could not carry. So it's, it's good, very good already. I wish at that time I had a tent to have some privacy, to do some toiletry inside or thing like that. Never can. Always have to wait for night time, or have to fi- go very far to find an isolated spot to bath or something like that. Especially during the pilgrim uh, season, uh, there are millions of people. 
surrounding everywhere that is uh, holy and famous. So you almost have no privacy at all. <laughs> you learn to adapt. <laughs> you use whatever, cover yourself around, make a, <laughs> make a sentry <laughs> for your bath, <laughs> or bath with full clothes in the icy water, and then jump out after you count to five. <laughs> yeah, because the water just ice, just zero. It just melted directly from the icy rock, like a, like a gango tree. You know gango tree, honey? Yes. Gango tree is the place people believe where the Ganges water comes from. And actually, where, that's where it is. It's the, 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 the head of the, the Ganges River. And when you go there, you see the, the river water coming from the, the mountain, melted from the ice there. Immediately, just drop down and fall down, fall down in there. So the water there is around zero. If, if, uh, if it's not because of the stiff way like this, I don't think the water will flow. And it's the flowing water that keeps it liquid, I think so. Otherwise, it's all ice there. Because of the, the slanted uh, shape, you know, from the mountain up to the plain, so the water will fall, fall down. And whenever the sun comes out a little bit, the water will melt, and that's what makes the river. Ganges River. So there, people came and bathed to cleanse their sin. So I believe my sins were also cleansed because I bathed there too. But you, I count to five and jump out. Because if you wait until six, then you're gone. <laughs> you became ice cream and never came out, come out of it. It's really frozen. And you don't have a bathroom, nothing. You have to jump right in the river with the clothes on. And I wash my hair also because I worry my hair might carry some sin. So <laughs> I shampoo everything. <laughs> and it was so cold. <laughs> you really have to count, you know. You worry that if you don't count, you stay there forever or flow down. Because it froze, the whole body suddenly became like stand still. So you have to jump out quickly, huh? And you have to wait until there's a sun in order to bath. If there's no sun, you're finished. Hmm? So when I jump out of the, the, of the, the water, of icy water, and into the sun, wow, it's like the whole body uh, blooming with flowers. Yes, yes. All the cells. <laughs> ah, you feel, feel great. So I did it again three more times. <laughs> Just to make sure that all the sins have been washed away. <laughs> I never know how much sins I have, so I just wash them all, <laughs> head and toes. <laughs> uh, most Indian people, they don't dare do that. I don't see them jump into that water. They probably do that uh, downstream, where it's warm in the plain, you know, like Harvard or Benares, uh, where it's warmer in the plain down there, but not in, on the top of the Himalaya mountain where the origin where the, the Ganges uh, River originates, because it's, it's really cold there. All over the place are snow mountain and snow, snow very high, very high, you know. And then the, only there is the water. And in May, the sun, there, come, there, there comes the sun. And you already rely on that. And then uh, if you wash there, it's too cold. So they, all they do is just deep water, you know, and slash it on their body, some, some places or some face, and then they do something you know, and evoke, invoke the name of God and just splash a few drops <laughs> on their head or drink it. Just symbolic. Yeah? And they believe their sins are washed already. Maybe it is true because they have, have to walk a long way from uh, the cities and endure a lot of hardship and risk in order to get there. So maybe if they are so sincere like that, their sins will be also washed away somewhat. With their, their own purity and sincerity uh, have touched God's power, I think. I think it helps. <laughs> because you feel very good there. At least in the Himalaya, there's no con contamination of thought. When you're there, you feel pure and blissful. Because the air is full of blessing, full of people's sincerity, and full of positive prayers. There's nothing but praise for God in such a places. No negative thinking, nothing but sincerity and pure devotion. So even if you are not uh, very attached to any particular place like Himalaya, but uh, you feel good there. Hmm. Feel really good. Ah, okay. 
But I was sad too. One time when I saw the people walking there barefooted, some of the laborers who carry people and they don't have shoes. And some, uh, sometimes they carry shoes, but their shoes were broken and their feet are blistered and bleeding. Oh, and I was so mad at God at that time. <laughs> I say, why you, you make so much trouble for human beings like this? What's the use of coming here worshiping you and people have to suffer like this? And I was really uh, very hurt, you know? So I walked down the mountain crying. And then uh, I was crying. And then when I came to down the hill and there was a monk who uh, pitched his tent there. They, they, my Indian tent are very simple, just a, just a roof with a plastic sheet. That's it, made by the branches nearby. And they put a plastic sheet on it. And then they make a fire in the corner and they put a blanket in the other corner and they put a Shiva or whatever image uh, on that bed <laughs> and on top of their bed and that's it, <laughs> that's their tent. And during pilgrim season, many monks would pitch their tent like that, a hut, huh? their, their hut, hut, huh? yeah, their hut uh, along the, the pilgrimage road. So the pilgrim people would give, give them arms, yeah, money or whatever, and then they buy the necessity. And uh, the, the fire will keep them warm, and uh, the mosquito don't <laughs> grow there because it's too cold. And uh, so like that, they live like that. So when I went out the mountain crying, and I, I saw a monk uh, on, in his hut, so I stopped by and gave him some arms, like everybody else, some money. And he said, oh, where are you going and all that? We're talking. And I said, well, I went to, uh, just now I went to, uh, uh, I don't know, somewhere else, not Gango Tree, somewhere else. It's also as holy and famous uh, to the Indian uh, pilgrim. Uh, Yamna trees, or something like that, yes. I was crying and I coming down. And he said, why are you crying like that? He called me child. <laughs> oh, child, why are you crying like that? He speak uh, in an Indian language, you know. Child, why are you crying like that? <laughs> So I told him the reason. <laughs> I told him that I nearly lost my faith in God because he seemed to uh, uh, make so much trouble for people. For my brothers and sisters, I see them walking in the ice, very slippery ice, and bare feet like this, or bleeding feet, and try to earn some money from the pilgrim. And I don't like what I saw. And I, I wonder why God is so cruel like this at that time. Yeah? <laughs> So the monk said, I say, why, uh, why people pray to God and he doesn't come to them? So he said, only one sentence. He said, God comes only at the last minute. <laughs> and up to now, I still don't understand <laughs> what he's talking about. <laughs> but that uh, comforted me. Huh? And then he explained to me that, oh, you don't know. These people are not ordinary people. Huh? They are vowed to come down as a laborers to carry people to God. And that's very good for them. You should not feel sorry. And then I was enlightened. <laughs> oh, I feel good. <laughs> I feel very good. And I said, how about the horses? <laughs> the horses also endure so much hardship to carry people to such and such a holy shrine. He said, well, yes, these are also holy beings. They incarnated as horses. <laughs> Oh, he was very positive. And then he said, no, come sit down, my child, have some food. Yeah, and he gave me some prasad, you know, blessed food, sweet, you know. And I was very happy because I have some sweet, <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> and so after I, I uh, pay uh, respect to him, I just went down the mountain and feel better. And then I went, I went down into the temple, and I, they also treated me so nice and... Uh, and later they give me an ordination name in Hindu. Um, what? Mandakini? Mandakini Giri, something like that. There's a river called Mandakini? Huh? Mandakini, yes, 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 yes. Because I was, uh, I was there near the river Mandakini, sitting there. Uh, and there was temple monks inside there. And later they, they ordained me to Hindu. 
<laughs> give me a name called Mandakini. Mandakini is my name. Giri is their uh, traditional lineage. Came from whatever Giri, I don't know. Must be a very great monk, uh, you know. <laughs> the lineage is called Giri. Hmm? And my name Mandakini, but I almost forgot about it. <laughs> and I was sitting there in the river. Just because before that I also talked to them, other monks and they, he listened to the conversation about me feeling very sad, you know. And, uh, but I felt already better, yeah? And when I went to the river, I saw too many people there, so I went to the, uh, I went to the temple and I saw many people there, so I went to the river and sat next to the river, uh, thinking, and sit like this. And so many people surround me and said, don't do anything silly, will you? <laughs> I was thinking of God and meditating, you know, <laughs> but they, because I sit next to the river on top of a stone, you know, very deep place there, deep water, so they surround me, don't leave me. They never left me again until I went back to the temple. And I wanted, all I wanted was some quietude and, and, and solitude and silence to meditate after a long journey and tiredness. I don't want to see people. And they worry that I'll jump inside or something. Oh, my goodness. And so I never had my silence and quietness again. They keep following me everywhere <laughs> since that day. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so I had to leave that, that temple after some time. <clears throat> okay, okay, let's go back to the mango. Otherwise, you are exasperate. You want to eat the mango. Wow, I nearly finished. Okay. So we go back to Benares, huh? <clears throat> so after a long journey <laughs> of many days and many nights, the king and his uh, retinues reach the destination. And, um, and they saw the mango tree uh, grow next to the river bank. So they all went down and had the delightful feast of the rich, juicy mango. When the night came, the king lay down to sleep at the foot of the tree, <laughs> reluctant to leave. <laughs> and they uh, made a lot of bonfire, uh, fire, blazing fires around to keep the beast away. Uh, late at night, when the king was fast asleep uh, and all the guards were dozing, <laughs> then all the monkeys and the king came, the king of the monkey came. And they jump from one branch to another to get the leftover fruits and eat them. And the king heard so much noises, so he woke up because <laughs> eight thousands of them, can you believe it? But this is exaggerated. How can eight thousand monkeys eat from one tree? Huh? With all these uh, kings and sentries and all that as well. There must be a very special tree, huh? Indian story are like that, full of <laughs> full of mystery that you have to <laughs> solve it yourself or imagine. Just like uh, all the time, the the Sekamoni Buddha born as the golden what, and right in Benares in the same dynasty, <laughs> and meet the same king and queen all the time and have the same trouble <laughs> again all the time with them. <laughs> he could have told them, next time I will incarnate as a monkey. Just leave me alone. <laughs> It's the same king, huh? <clears throat> so the king was uh, awakened by this noise of 8,000 monkeys and the king. So he told his soldiers to uh, get up and uh, surround the trees and uh, get ready with the, 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 the bows and the arrows. They want to shoot some monkeys in order to eat them in the morning. He said, in the morning we will eat the monkey flesh and the mango. <laughs> monkey and mango would be very nice. He said like that. So the monkeys overheard the king's uh, words, and trembling with fear, they went to the chief, you know, the king, king of the monkey. And they said, Oh, sir, you have warned us, but uh, um, because we didn't know there was the one fruit or, uh, which has fallen into the river and carried down the stream. And now the strange man come here to get the fruit. And the least leader even want to eat our flesh. So they order his archers to shoot us. Uh, the tree is surrounded and we cannot escape. What are we to do? So the king monkey say, do not be afraid. 
my children. I will find a way to save you. So he comforted them and then I jumped over to another side of the river. I got a, a long bamboo pole and brought it back to, uh, to where he was before. He was thinking the pole was measured long enough uh, so that he can tie it on his waist and then uh, make a bridge from there to the other uh, branch of uh, other, Gan- other Ganges river bank so that they don't have to, uh, they can escape from the tree to the other side, so no problem. But uh, he miscalculated somewhat and the, and the bamboo pole was a little bit short. So he could not rely on the bamboos alone. So he has to bend his uh, whole body, uh, holding onto the trees and using his back to uh, make up for the shortage of the bamboo pole. So all the monkey, he tell them to jump on top of his head, uh, on his back, and then walk on his back and walk toward the, the bamboo pole and go to the other side. Mm. So uh, everybody like that went to the other bank and no problem. But there was uh, one monkey, the last one, called Devadatta, who was very jealous of this monkey king. So he thought of himself to make uh, more trouble for him. So when he jumped on the monkey's king's back, he jumped very, very hard with all his might and broke the back of the monkey's king. And then he jumped away. It was the king of the monkey was in great pain. And he fell in the river. But the king, Brahmadatta, who has observed, observed all this going on, felt very touched by the compassionate king monkey. So he ordered his men to rescue him from the river and brought him to the fire and put him in fine clothes and feed him and give him water, etc., etc., and medicine and uh, uh, some uh, balm for his back so to uh, uh, make him recover again. <coughs> and then he will ask him when the chief of the monkey uh, regained consciousness, you made a bridge of your body for the monkeys to cross. In doing so, you have given your life. What are you to them? And what are they to you, a great monkey? The dying monkey replied, Oh, Your Majesty, they were my children, and I was their chief and guide. They loved and trusted me. I do not grieve to leave this world because I have gained my subjects' freedom. If you would rule well, remember that the happiness and welfare of your people must always come first. Saying this, the monkey chief closed his eyes and died peacefully. King Brahmadatta ordered that the dead monkey be given the funeral honors of a king. A shrine was erected at the place uh, of uh, cremation. Torches were burnt there, an offering of incense and flowers were made. When the king returned to Benares, he built another shrine in honor of the monkey chief and commanded all his subjects to pay homage to the memory of so brave an animal. All his life he remembered the last words of the monkey chief and ruled his people wisely and well. Finished. Very good story, huh? Whether it's true or not. Hmm? Befitted a Buddha's statue, status. Now, when we come to think of it, many kings or leaders are not fit to be the monkey. <laughs> so we always look down upon animals. But if this story, this story is a true story, then uh, some of us humans have to really feel ashamed. 
Now when uh, you go to India, perhaps you will see many shrines of the monkeys. Perhaps this came from this story, that the, the shrines of the monkey come from this true story. Uh, there are another monument for Hanuman, Hanuman, but Hanuman, but maybe it's a different one. Also, he looks like a monkey. And he he's supposed to be a very wise monkey of the ancient Indian kingdom, and he has helped uh, many of uh, beings, including uh, uh, King Rama, uh, Rama of uh, you know the Ramayana, the story of King Rama. He was exiled, and then uh, later he given back the kingdom again. Mm. He defeated many demons with the help of Hanuman. And I don't know if these two stories connected with each other or not, but they're both monkeys. <laughs> ah, so you don't wonder why the Indian people worship animals such as monkeys or buffalo or cows, whatever, huh? Because they believe all beings have a soul and have wisdom and have goodness in them. And even in modern time, it's proved to be so, huh? Through some of the uh, story we see in the press, yeah, about animals rescuing human beings or their own kind, etc., etc., or do so many extraordinary things, benefiting others and humankind and themselves. And this should be enough for us to learn to respect animals and protect them and love them. All right, thank you for your loving attention. Now pretend to meditate for 20 minutes until lunch time, oh, dinner time. <laughs> Four o'clock dinner, right? Okay. So pretend to be holy for a while, huh? Together. Mm.